Hello, everybody. It is my great pleasure to be here today to introduce the session, Statecraft. What role does data play in the world of diplomacy? We have an all-star international panel for you here today, and it is my great pleasure to be joined um, by uh, Jenny Hall, who is Deputy Director in the International Data Unit at the Department of Culture, Media and Sport in the UK government. Teki Akute Falconer, who is the Founder and Executive Director of the Africa Digital Rights Hub. And we also have Arindrajit Basu, who is the Research Lead at the Centre for Internet and Society in India. I'm Anne Flanagan. I am a data policy project lead at the World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution in California, where we look at how to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks of technology. And of course, data underpins all of those technologies that we rely on uh, every day and have become so entrenched in our lives. But today we're leveling up the conversation to look at the, the international world and how international governments are interacting with each other and indeed treating this issue. Um, and to begin our conversation here today, I'd like to, to introduce, uh, introduce Jenny Hall uh, from, from the Department of Digital uh, Culture, Media and Sport in the UK government. And Jenny, I want to ask you a, a question to begin with that we will ask all of our panelists in turn. Um, and that is that we usually think of data as being a tech issue or a privacy issue. Um, so why are you here today to uh, discuss data as a diplomacy issue? And from your individual perspective, can you share what has changed in this field over recent years to bring about this cohesion between tech policy, data policy, privacy policy, and the world of diplomacy? Well, thank you, Anne. And I think that's an absolutely brilliant uh, question. Um, data is truly international. That we're able to have this conversation today across multiple time zones is due to the flow of data across international borders. So data diplomacy or data cooperation and collaboration, when I think about it, is about working with international partners to ensure that global data governance and arrangements and frameworks underpin those essential services, those communications, and flows of ideas and trade, supporting better outcomes for all. The second point I wanted to make is that data is really powerful. Data use and access presents a major opportunity for economic growth, innovation, scientific research, and boosting national and economic security and resilience. Or, of course, it can be used for more nefarious purposes. And my final point was that data is about people. It's about their lives and about their livelihoods. It can transform almost every aspect of the economy and it will help us address some of society's most pressing challenges. And we've seen that uh, you know, to a great extent through the COVID pandemic uh, that we're going through at the moment. So that sounds like a pretty important set of diplomatic issues from my perspective. Thank you so much, Jenny. Yes, indeed, when people talk about foreign policy, uh, you hear different versions of foreign policy, but oftentimes it's domestic policy issues that are that are really being discussed internationally and, and finding commonalities. Uh, Teki, let's turn to, to Teki Akute uh, Falconer and, and let's ask you the same question, Teki. From your perspective in Africa, how are, how are we seeing these issues merging and, and what has been changing recently? So the whole notion of technology has changed and, and especially with a continent like Africa seeing technology as a way to leapfrog its socioeconomic development is we are really beginning to have to look at the diplomatic aspects of these technologies. We're seeing technologies, not just as technologies, but enablers of our economies, you know, and for you to operate in this space you cannot exist in an island. You need to be able to operate with others, whether within your region or outside of your region. And so we have to start having these uh, conversations. We're beginning to also see technologies as enablers of competition. And, and, and in that respect, you know, you're getting into the space of service provision and trade, you know, and, and it's not just limited to the, the, the jurisdiction of your countries where there are laws, but some of these trade and service relations are extending beyond our continents and, and going into other countries. And so, you know, the discussions and the negotiations do not necessarily have to be within our countries, but with other countries and other partners as well. I I think that because of the way we are 
seeing technology and data use across the globe, you know, we are put in a position where the conversations no more has to be domestic, but has to be extended internationally, which is increasing a lot of diplomatic relationships around data collection, around data use, around data sharing and the like. And, and we see Africa actually also following this trend. So that's why we tend to see this increasing issues around diplomacy. Fascinating. And that, and that, that that shift to, to data as, or, or technology and data as an enabler um, of economic and development and growth is, is really, I think, a, a step change that we've seen in economies right across the world. I'd like to uh, bring in uh, Arindrit um, Basu from, from India. Uh, uh, Arindrajit, can you, uh, can you please give us your perspective from, from Asia and, and the work that you have been doing uh, researching this space? Yeah, thanks, and it's a real privilege to be with such esteemed uh, panelists uh, at this uh, session. Um, so to start off with, I think when we look at diplomacy, uh, we need to recognize that the myth or the ideology that was there on internet governance in the 1990s, that in completely deregulated and unregulated space, free from state interference, that didn't really work out the way it was thought, right? So there will need to be some sort of state regulation or the assertion of sovereignty. The question is whether states will assert uh, sovereignty and accountability in a manner that works for citizens and communities or whether uh, they will assert it in a manner that concentrates power within the hands of a few. I think another way of uh, kind of explaining this, and I was thinking of how to answer this great question. And as I was thinking, I uh, engaged in a transaction on Amazon. I ordered some masks. And, and then I thought that that simple transaction actually implicates a lot of global governance questions. So you have security, the, of course, the security of the data itself, and also the critical infrastructure that allows uh, that data transaction to take place. And that debate is going on at the United Nations First Committee on how is uh, how, uh, on cybersecurity. Then there is the economic aspect. So where is that data stored? Um, uh, what will the uh, free, uh, free flow of data look like? The, competitive aspects, the competition law, how should we regulate Amazon as a, as a, as a technical uh, entity, taxation that's being debated at the, at the OE, o, OECD, how do we tax multinational companies? And then finally, uh, the rights question, how, how is privacy, uh, the individual's privacy and the community's privacy protected? And all of these point to, I think, two key reasons. One, that data diplomacy is not just between states, but there are, as I was mentioning, multiple stakeholders who are key actors in it. And the speakers before me have already alluded to how it could be data and technology could be an avenue for empowerment, but at the same time, uh, depending on how states regulate it could also act as an avenue for suppression. And, and the second uh, point is that the economic security and rights-based aspects are inextricably interlinked. So if we are looking to regulate data today, we can't look at it in isolation because in, when, it, when an individual actually engages in that transaction, which is at the end of the day, what diplomacy is trying to benefit individuals and communities across the, across the world, that transaction implicates all these three realms. And therefore, I think the global governance of data and even technology in general draws from various regimes and from uh, various disciplines. And, and it's uh, therefore great to be in, again, in such a uh, geographically diverse and also with people from, who have expertise across disciplines uh, today. I'll end there and hopefully we can pick up on some of these threads. And thank you for raising that very interesting point about all of the different stakeholders that the diplomacy beyond just just nation states it's it's really such a world where it's it's, it's so cross cutting um, that the that the role of businesses and civil society actors in it and indeed we as people is is so important in terms of of this international picture of how this shift in the system um, is coming about that's something we're very passionate about at the World Economic Forum is that that public private cooperative space, but. Moving uh, back to Jenny, Jenny, you're in a, a really unique position in the UK government right now post Brexit, um, and and the UK has been has been very proactive in uh, developing data strategy over the the, the preceding months. Uh, from from your vantage point, what do you see as the opportunities and the risks of this shift? I think there's a couple of um, kind of key. Uh, key opportunities for this moment right now, and I think that's quite important. The first, the first is we actually have a window of opportunity post-COVID or when we arrive at a, a moment post-COVID. 
Um, I mentioned it in my opening piece, but when we look at the experience of data use and data sharing during the pandemic, we really shifted the dial in terms of what became uh, normal in terms of people operating on, on digital systems and, and relying on data flows as they do so. Um, we saw a massive increase in the use of digital technologies. We saw industries that wouldn't normally have thought of themselves as digital or, or enabled by data uh, suddenly becoming so and having to become so to keep operating during the pandemic. Um, we saw actions taken to enable or to, to kind of nudge behaviours in favour of data sharing. We had here in the UK, we had some actually some legislation passed on uh, requiring the sharing of relevant patient information uh, where it was relevant to, to, to solving COVID-19 issues. Um, we have more of a conversation, I think, in the last 18 months, certainly here in the UK, on privacy issues. So, um, you know, actually talking about some of the, the challenges that, that we grapple with at the uh, kind of the government level, at the legislative level, those were conversations happening between ordinary people, you know, me and my, uh, me and my family, who wouldn't ordinarily kind of have been really thinking about this. But also alongside those conversations, an increased appreciation of the value and the usefulness of data-enabled technologies in our, in our everyday lives. So I think as we move towards looking towards a recovery around the world, looking for those opportunities, those behaviours that shifted, those things that we managed to make work, um, those are some really key things for us to, to think through collectively. And I do think that that, that window will close and is probably starting to close um, in areas where, where the pandemic is, is broadly coming under control. So I think that there is an imperative for us to act now. Beyond that, you mentioned in your question, uh, the other key sort of opportunity for us here in the UK at the moment is the opportunity presented by leaving the EU. Uh, and people may be aware we have, the UK government has a consultation live at the moment uh, on the reforms that we may look to make to our domestic data protection regime. The, the EU's data protection laws are now five years old or so, which is a long time in this world. Like a lot has changed in that time. And we think there are opportunities to make some of those tweaks and changes, whether it's to support research and innovation, whether it's to reduce burdens on businesses, particularly smaller businesses, whether it's to deliver better public services, or whether it's to support those trade and data flows that Techie was talking about. Um, we think there's ways that we can do this better, um, and that's certainly what those reforms are designed to do. Importantly, what we're focusing on is outcomes, so on striking the right balance between citizens' privacy while also creating the optimal conditions for growth and innovation. But I want to bring in Techie here because Techie, Africa is at a similar but different point of opportunity. There is not this rigorous uh, legacy framework of laws. In fact, for a lot of African nations, data protection regulation is a very new space. So just data enabling regulation in general, anything that is going to, to support the digital economy how, how do you see that space evolving? Are nations cooperating with each other? Or is everybody competing with each other? Please give us, give us an insight into, into how things are going there. We have an opportunity to leapfrog on what the rest of the world has done, uh, which is good. But at the same time, you know, the world is not waiting for us. And, and these Africa almost adopts these technologies and implements just as the technologies come up. So the, the moment we are unable to, you know, streamline uh, discussions around the right frameworks, um, discussions around the right policies and, and laws that should be in the country, discussion around information sharing within the ecosystem, and, and discussions around how we will build bridges, you know, to, to as, as a way of harmonizing the diversity that we see in on our continent. It, it continues to be a change, a, a, a challenge because we continue to lag behind. Our industries are lagging behind. And what we tend to see is that a lot of uh, businesses and international or multinational companies tend to have a big advantage over our local and young growing businesses. And it minimizes the opportunities for our continent to also interact in this space where we have the skill as well to be able to, to develop. So we tend to become more consumers in this space. And I think that is also 
one area where we have to have start having these conversations because in the consumer space as well, uh, what tends to happen is that we we become you know uh, we tend to suffer if if I should find the right word for it we we tend to suffer from the effect of not having the right policies in place or not having the right negotiations so companies that have competitive edge or are stronger uh, than a lot of our economies or individual countries can tend to bring us to a place where our countries could even be bullied, you know, into accepting certain kinds of technologies that do not necessarily inure to the benefit of our people, to accept policies that do not necessarily inure to our benefit. And, and it takes us back to a place of, you know, neocolonization of a sort. If, if we do not have these diplomatic discussions properly, Africa will then again be put into a place of neocolonization where we are still using these technologies to, to you know, take advantage of, of our continents and our people and the resources that are available to us. Thank you, Turkey. Yeah, some, some real risks there around fragmentation between different countries and how they approach data policy at a regional level. Um, and thank you for sharing uh, the, those risks. Uh, tur turning to a sort of more of a, an analysis space, I'd like to, to bring Arindraji back into the picture. The, the regional dynamics are a little different um, in India and in, and in Asia, because of course India is the second largest um, or second most populous country on earth. So there is a, a real powerhouse there, but I know that you've researched this area both nationally and regionally and, and indeed globally as well to see how those power dynamics um, are playing out. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about what you have learned? So just to give some context for our, our viewers on, on data localization in India, it started off with a, a directive from the Central Bank of India, the Reserve Bank, uh, which basically said that all financial data would need to be uh, stored within, uh, within India. That was back in April 2018. Since then, there have been a number of uh, sectoral notifications, whether it is in the insurance space and the pharmaceutical space that mandate some form of uh, local storage or processing. And the big uh, kind of in, uh, intersector uh, possibly uh, localization mandates have come from two iterations of the personal data protection bill, which is uh, presently uh, being debated by a joint parliamentary committee. So of course, over this period, there have been a number of actors uh, lobbying extensively in this ecosystem for, for obviously both interests and value driven. So uh, foreign technology companies, Facebook and Google, obviously, uh, it would significantly increase uh, com compliance costs and they have tried to uh, show why data localization could potentially uh, uh, be harmful and uh, and of course then there are there is player, play, players from domestic industry who feel that data localization would would be beneficial so why i wanted to start with data localization is because i think this uh, topic has often been looked at as I mean, a topic in itself, and uh, there are obviously the risks of fragmentation and what uh, Jenny was speaking about, there is a dire need to uh, compile of a number of studies to actually show what the economic costs or other costs of data localization, the technical costs might be, and the potential benefits as well. But the way I see localization is as a symptom of larger uh, regulatory challenges when we talk about global cooperation, right? So uh, wh what do I mean? So one of the reasons that India is used for justifying uh, localization is the fact that law enforcement agencies in India have to go through a hugely cumbersome, a process that takes almost six to eight months to get data for an investigation that is going on in India where the uh, accused and the, the victim are, are all based in India, but the data is stored somewhere else. And uh, there needs to be compliance with the electronic, usually it's in the US, so the Electronic Communications Privacy Act comes into the mix. That's a, that's a legitimate concern. Is data localization the solution? Obviously, possibly not, because that leads to a number of other uh, jurisdictional questions as well. Um, possibly an executive data sharing agreement is the solution for that. There may be some surveillance reform, but to ignored the justification entirely, I don't think is uh, is correct. Similarly, the economic justification that's placed, that uh, this idea of data colonialism, where uh, a limited number of companies from abroad are essentially uh, 
kind of exploiting india and 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 getting uh, getting rich again there is some there is some truth to that but again is is localization and fragmentation the solution especially given the costs that it might have for local businesses and local consumers that's something that you need much more much more evidence for so the larger point that i'm making is that when countries engage in uh, domestic policy frameworks and when that translates into how uh, they negotiate globally and and this is obviously from an indian standpoint there are a number of justifications for a policy recommendation that justifications may be entirely valid but this there is kind of a problem solution mismatch and i think that is where conversations interdisciplinary conversations cross border conversations become absolutely vital uh, evidence based empirical based conversations become absolutely vital of course india did not sign up to the osaka track in in 2019 uh, which was was the data free flow with trust that jenny was speaking about and the opposition to that was on the basis largely of the fact that india still had not uh, figured out what the data localization uh, domestic data localization policy would be um india is also not part of the joint statement initiative talks that are going on at the wto which are essentially looking to have uh, a trade agreement under the aegis of of the wto as well and there there are various lines of opposition including some technical procedural arguments on whether that initiative is is correct or not so there is definite flexibility there but the broader question is that to what extent and this i think is a question for emerging economies is that to what to what extent is, do is it okay for them to give up sovereign policy making space to be a part of the global trading system and how much policy space is required for nascent digital industries in emerging economies to grow till uh, global trading obligations can come into play and i think that is the key kind of tension that countries are grappling with obviously everyone wants to benefit from a cooperative uh, global trading system but then the question is how can countries ensure that those benefits work for especially citizens and 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 individuals but also kind of the local business ecosystem and and my personal stake is more for small uh, smaller businesses in emerging economies rather than the kind of big giants so there's no point i think in having a, a an indian replica of facebook that comes with the same uh, kind of uh, challenges and, and questions but can we really have a more uh, democratic business space and and, and how can global cooperation be used to galvanize uh, galvanize that space let, let me stop there Thank you so much, uh, Rinjaji. Excellent points there made by all of the speakers, and 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 I think we're we're seeing a picture emerge of just how complex this space is. But I want to really lean into uh, those levers of power that we're hearing about because ultimately this session is about statecraft and data and diplomacy. Um, and and I think from a scholastic perspective, you're really looking at military power and economic power as the two traditional hard powers. Are we now looking at data as a hard power, is there, or even a soft power? I think on on the soft power end of things, we're seeing, and and, and a couple of the speakers have mentioned trade. We're seeing how countries are weaving in, or even the EU, for example, weaving in digital provisions into uh, free trade agreements. So you have no longer a, a, what is a, a clean vertical space. You have overlapping policy areas, and and data and digital really tend to come as a as a package of measures. Would anyone like to to comment on on the power dynamics and and how how this is really playing out? Because this, if you're if you're in business or if you're if you're not involved in this world whatsoever. It, might be a space that you're unaware of but those power dynamics between larger nations we, we've heard how larger nations can afford to have data localization measures maybe smaller nations can't afford that luxury would anyone like to to jump in here yes yes um clearly the the power dynamics is 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 a very very critical issue and 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 that is why it is important to start having um these conversations um especially I'll, I'll give you an example around free flow of data and data sharing there are a number of african countries that have applied for adequacy i believe it's going on to about 10 years right um none of these countries have been given adequacy even though there are assurances that it will be done and and for those of us that sit in the back we know that it is because of the power dynamics a lot of these nations do not com compete at the same time when you look at europe it has actually granted adequacy to a number of other countries that it had other mutual economic interests with so the the power dynamics in this space is is very is very critical 
And the, the worry that we have coming from the African continent is that our countries and our businesses will be disadvantaged if these power dynamics are not uh, properly looked at, right? We will be disadvantaged because our countries are very small. We will be disadvantaged and, and we already seen the effect of it, right? I, I remember when I, I, I became the head of Ghana's Data Protection Commission, um, a multinational uh, company uh, told me in the face, we're not gonna comply with your laws. At the same time, they were actually operating in our country. So here is a situation where we have laws similar to laws in Europe, and yet when it came to our laws, not that they did not have the capability of complying because they are complying to other countries and other standards, you know, but they were not going to respect those laws. So I remember the, the issues and discussions, and it wasn't just Ghana that was having that issue. It was almost all the countries with data protection authorities having similar challenges, which led to the formation of um, a network of data protection regulators to see how you would be able to navigate this in order to get the protection of, of your people, of your citizens, you know, assured somehow. And we even realized that with the setting up of all of that, it probably will take Africa as a continent with which is much more stronger to negotiate some of these relationships as exists, you know, with the rest of the world and with multinationals, as opposed to weaker countries. But we're not there yet. And, it, it, and yet our people are suffering from the impact of, of, of these laws, from the impact of countries not recognizing that we also have the same citizens that have equal rights, which must be respected and pr protected. And so the power dynamics is, is very important. And in this space that we're in, the data space, we're not just dealing with the power dynamics between governments. We're also dealing with power dynamics between governments and multinationals that have become even stronger than, than government. And it is a worrying trend, but the question is how do we, you know, come out and effectively address some of these issues? Great points there, Techie. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And on that last point that you just raised there, the business perspective, the economic perspective, and I'd love to, to bring in a, a Rinjajita and Jenny on this point, but uh, Jenny made the point earlier on, data is borderless, companies have choices. So if it's a large company, they can be very choosy about where they make their investment. That matters to governments because governments want jobs, they want innovation, they want to support the economy. And on the other side of the coin, when you have startups, when you have scale-ups, when you have indigenous companies, they need to be supported to potentially grow internationally. So you have this really interesting tautology of the pros and the cons of more restrictive versus more open policy. So I'd like to invite our other speakers in here to, to comment on, on, on any anything in that space that you think is very uh, worthwhile for our audience to be paying attention to. If I can just quickly come in with a brief comment on, on the constitutional aspect of things. And, and I think mm -hmm. when we speak about you know, data sovereignty, obviously various jurisdictions are still figuring out what exactly it means and what the specific policy prescriptions are. But when we look at kind of how sovereignty could be a way to empower citizens, we don't need to look, I mean, too far back. Take the recent uh, Schrems 2 decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union, right? Where essentially the court decided that the surveillance framework, the state surveillance, especially the extraterritorial surveillance framework in the US is not in line with the aspirations of the European human rights protection uh, framework. And therefore, EU citizens data cannot be subjected to the kind of uh, uh, fairly lax legal regime on extraterritorial surveillance that enables intelligence agencies in the US to uh, access, access data. And that was essentially data sovereignty, I think, at its best, where the constitutional human rights framework was used to protect individuals and, and, and consumers and users of, of the digital space. And so when we talk about sovereignty, and this is where, linking back to what I was 
speaking about before, that it's about how jurisdictions, including both the executive and the courts and the negotiators, why they are making or taking a certain policy stance. Is it, do you want more sovereignty because you want to conduct greater surveillance on your citizens and therefore you want to restrict policy space? Is it because you want to empower a limited number of, of businesses either in your country or foreign uh, tech giants? Or are you putting the citizens at the heart of the debate? And I think that uh, the, the Schrems decision and a number of some other policies that have come out of Europe recently also embody the fact that individuals and, and consumers are at the heart of it. And, and that's when I, I think about India. The Indian constitutional framework is as rich as that of the any human rights framework in, in the world, which marries both civil liberties with uh, socioeconomic empowerment. And I think that as India sets about creating its digital policy vision through specific measures such as data localization and even other uh, measures such as the data protection bill or, or data governance frameworks, I think it's very important to essentially, again, put the individual and consumer at the heart of it. And, and as, as soon as that happens, I think that is the real uh, antidote for the kind of power asymmetries that exists in the global digital economy today. And thank you for raising that last point about uh, those, I think that those, those three levers that we see, the surveillance, the economic piece, and then the human rights piece. I'd love to bring Jenny in because Jenny, you mentioned the, the reform that the UK is, is, is looking at in respect to, for example, the GDPR. And the GDPR is a tool that's been put in place to, uh, to, to, um, to respect and to put power behind the, the data rights of people. How do we improve international cooperation in a way that is going to put people first. I mean, the, the overall theme of, of, of today's summit is data and people. I think that's a it's it's a it's a it's a fitting point to to bring in here. So Jenny, how do we how do we put people first in international cooperation? So I think reflecting on that and the comments from, from other panelists, for me it comes back to the point I made around outcomes. So this should be about how do we achieve the right outcomes for people? How do we ensure that uh, that their privacy rights are respected, that they can trust the technologies that you're using. That's the really important thing here. And listening to the other panelists, I mean, you know, the, the EU with its with existing GDPR, I think has only has only made 12 or 13 adequacy decisions. As we look to take forward uh, our new legislation and our, our new reforms, we will be able to make UK decisions and we will be looking to make more decisions and to look globally at those opportunities. So it's not about... To achieve those outcomes, you don't have to do things in exactly the same way, right? And even GDPR says that, actually, but that's a really important point. Because when you're looking at some of the, the economic and political dynamics that we've heard play out in the conversation today, I would add to that, by the way, the different cultural dynamics, um, different norms and values across different nations, different uh, legal and political systems and kind of historical systems. So I think from my perspective, it's really about ensuring that the approaches we take are interoperable, they can kind of, you know, um, dock into one another, the global standards and norms that we set can be achieved in a range of different ways and meet those same outcomes. I think that's got to be the real key here. And that's got to achieve, um, you know, the best outcomes for, for people that you're describing. Thanks so much, Jenny. And, and what, what a great note to wrap up this session on. I think we could speak here all day. There's so many different policy areas and so many different topics that, that really creep into this conversation around statecraft and diplomacy. And we can really see how all of those issues are, are things that ultimately that countries care about. I want to do a really quick fire round with our panelists to leave everybody with a last word. Can you all, um, uh, for, our, for our stakeholders here today, governments, businesses, academics, civil society, somebody who's just here out of their personal interest, I want to ask the panelists one by one in about 15 to 30 seconds, can you give one piece of advice that will improve multilateral cooperation uh, in your view? Let's start with Jenny, just very quickly, Jenny, one action that you think is, is incredibly important. So I think the thing to land is that good data use has uh, has the real potential that we've heard in this talk today to make all different kinds of organizations and institutions across private, public and third sectors more informed, more connected, more prosperous, safer, healthier, even happier. So data can be a force for good. We have to work together to make it that way. And we have to ensure we're doing so in a way that respects different approaches around the world. Fantastic. Techie. I think my, my final words would be that everyone should be included in, in the discussions. Fantastic. Um, 
that was that was going to be my uh, final <laughs> final word as well but i think uh, so thank you for 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 saying that um yeah i think just to build on that if we are to have equitable frameworks that balance the benefits of free trade with uh, domestic policy space then you need to actually have smaller businesses civil society and individuals being part of the conversation rather than diplomacy being only limited to uh, state craft so just to back up what techy said there Wonderful. And thank you for, for landing on that, that note of multi-stakeholder cooperation being the key here. Uh, Teki, Arunjajit and Jenny, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, the audience, for tuning in um, and for o ODI for giving us this platform today. Wishing you all a wonderful day wherever you are. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.